Thank you so much. I've seen you around. Are you getting in front of me? You've no. Shorter. Okay, I'll go. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't have a microphone, so this, uh, if you I can't can. hear me, just let me know. Help me to speak up. Have us. All right, first of all, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I know the weather is horrible. Uh, didn't expect this big of a crowd under the rain, so thank you, everybody, for coming and for marching earlier today. Yay. Yes, yes. Yay. All right. So, um, going to be talking today about Bank of America. Uh, about a month ago, uh, I was assigned a story to write about Bank of America. And so I did some introductory phone calls. I called a friend of mine who worked in a hedge fund. And I said, uh, I'm doing a story about Bank of America, but I just need to, do, I need to know about the stuff that they did that was really, really bad. <laughs> I'll try. My check. <laughs> And he said, uh, how many pages are they going to give you? A thousand? Uh, and I said, well, I can only do a, a brief summary of the worst stuff they were involved in. And he goes, you're still going to need a thousand pages. All right, Bank of America. Um, basically, most of the bad stuff that this, that this and all the too big to fail banks were involved with, most of the corruption is somehow related to the mortgage business. And so I want to give you a brief overview of what happened with the mortgage business and mortgage-backed securities. Does everybody here know about mortgage-backed securities? Yes. 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 Explain. No. Explain. All right. So basically what this scam is about, I've been covering this for years. I've been trying to explain this to audiences. And the easiest way I can explain this is that it was banks selling oregano as weed. <laughs> and for the assembled press here, I didn't think of this just for Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> so how did this work? Uh, first of all, we got to back up in the old days and talk about why there wasn't corruption in the mortgage markets in the old days. Now, why in the old days didn't we give half a million dollar mortgages to people who didn't have jobs or were unemployed drug addicts? Does anybody know why? Because they can't pay it back. That's right, that's right, because they had to hold it on their books. In the old days when you got a mortgage, mortgages were a boring business. You went to your local bank or your local credit union, you asked for a mortgage, they gave it to you, and then they held that loan. So if you were an unemployed meth addict who was falling apart in that interview, they were not going to give you that loan. So ergo, we did not give out risky mortgages in the old days. So the banks had to find a way to give mortgages to people, to sell mortgages on a secondary market uh, in a way that disguised the poor quality of the borrowers. And how did they do this? They came up with this new technique called securitization and the collateralized debt obligation. Has anyone here heard of a CDO or a CMO? CMO. All right. Explain. All right, I'm going to explain. <laughs> what is a collateralized mortgage obligation? And I have a prompt. All a CDO is, or CMO, is just a big bag for putting mortgage payments in. Now, how did this work? Let's say I'm Bank of America, or more to the point, countrywide, a big mortgage lender. I got a billion dollars. I'm going to go out and I'm going to give everybody in this audience, I'm going to give you all a mortgage. All right? Yeah. Right? Is everybody happy? Does it yeah, you have maybe. jobs, you don't have jobs, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give everybody here a mortgage. And at the end of the month, I'm going to take this bag and I'm going to go around to everybody. I'm going to say, put your mortgage payment in at the end of the month. So please, it's the end of the month. Everybody throw your money in. All right. Now, what am I going to do? So I got this bag. And I'm Bank of America. And I'm going to go to all these investors, like pension funds, unions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, any big institutional investor. And what I'm going to say is, and I'm going to bring with me a, a couple of math geeks from uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, the ratings agencies. And what I'm going to say is, I've got this bag. I want you to buy shares in this bag. And according to our calculations, according to the calculations of these guys from the ratings agencies, 99.99% .99 of the time, at least this much of the bag is filled with money. All right? So forget about the fact that everybody in this audience, maybe they don't have jobs. Maybe they just got fired. Maybe they're not even citizens. 
Uh, maybe they have criminal records. Maybe they have terrible credit scores. Don't worry about that because according to our calculations, at least this much of the bag is going to be filled with money every month. So it makes a kind of sense. There's always going to be some money in the bag. But the question is how much money is going to be in the bag? Well, if they say 99.9% .9 of the time this much is going to be filled, that allows them to say to these investors, this, we're going to sell you this portion of the bag and we're going to call that a AAA rated security. All right? That means that if you invest in this portion of the bag, it's as safe as an, invest an investment as buying a U.S. Treasury bill or investing in the debt of a sovereign country like Luxembourg or the United Kingdom. Really? Really. really. That's what they said. And over a 10-year period, tens of thousands of these bags got sold and were given AAA ratings. And so when they went, when they went to meet with these investors, not only did they have these ratings agencies guys next to them, they also added a bunch of guarantees. They said, when we made these pools of loans, we also agreed that if any of these loans turn out to be defective, if any of them default ahead of time, we promise, and it's here in writing, we promise by law that we'll buy those loans back. No shit. No shit. <laughs> so we're going to buy these loans back, so you have nothing to worry about. And in addition to that, uh, wait, there's more. It's like those, those, uh, those commercials. Wait, there's more. Not only will we buy those loans back, not only are they AAA rated, um, but we've insured them. We've bought insu insurance on all these loans with big insurance companies like AMBAC and AIG uh, and MBIA. So if anything goes wrong with any of these bonds, any of these, these big packages of mortgages, you don't have to worry because not only is it AAA, not only will we buy, it, buy back any of the bad loans, but they're insured. Uh, and in addition, these AAA rated securities, they pay more than treasury bills or foreign debt. So you're getting a great deal. There's, there's no downside for you. And so what happened? All these state pension uh, <laughs> funds and, and union retirement funds and foreign retirement funds and mutual funds all around the world, they all bought this shit. They got bagged. They got bagged, exactly. <laughs> So what, what did they do? So, so they essentially turned a whole bunch of people like you who don't have jobs and were terrible credit risks, right? And they turned them into this. They turned them into a AAA rated security, something more secure than U.S. government debt. Wow. In the year 2006, again, there were 9,000 of these bags, these, these mortgage-backed pools that were given a AAA rating. Anyone want to guess how many U.S. corporations last year had a AAA rating? Does anyone know? All Zero. 1,200. Four. 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 Four corporations in the United States last year got a AAA, uh, got a AAA rating. AIG? That's like, no, not AIG. No. No. <laughs> so basically, even, even companies like Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, which has $20 billion in capital, Warren Buffett is not AAA rated, but an unemployed janitor in Los Angeles who has a mortgage is AAA rated. That was the basic scam of the financial crisis. That's what these guys did. They went around and they turned a bunch of oregano into high-grade weed and they sold it all around the world. How did they make money? Because they were selling stuff that was worthless as something that was extremely worthwhile, extremely valuable. Is that fraud? It is fraud. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do when you find out you can sell oregano as weed? What's the first thing you do after that? After you sell Buy all the make more oregano, exactly. So how did this work? What did it do? You, typically the situation was you had a bank like Bank of America or Goldman Sachs or Citigroup and they had a whole bunch of money and they gave like a billion, two billion dollars. They would give it to a mortgage lender like Countrywide and they would say, we bless you. Go out into the world and make loans. Give loans to anything with a pulse and we'll buy them back. And that's what Countrywide did. They went out, and Countrywide, by the way, ended up getting bought by Bank of America. They went out and they gave loans to everybody, everybody who was breathing. It didn't matter whether they had a job or not. Uh, sometimes when these people filled out applications, uh, there was one mortgage company that actually gave boxes of whiteout to new mortgage brokers so that they could white out the derogatory information. If somebody didn't have a big enough salary, they whited it out and put in a bigger salary. If somebody qualified for a, 
uh, a fixed rate loan, or a safe fixed rate loan. Sometimes they would put the fixed rate loan on the outside and underneath on the third or fourth page, they call this a thumb loan. You would have the application form for a risky adjustable rate loan. They went to an old ladies and they said, we want you to sign this paper. Uh, and they thought they were getting a safe fixed rate loan. They were actually getting risky adjustable rate loans and people Wells signed. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo did this. So they knew, the banks knew that, they, that these, these firms like Countrywide had very, very poor lending standards, that they were going out and lending to everybody, but they didn't care. And why didn't they care? Because they knew that they were going to sell this stuff immediately to unions, to pension funds, uh, and to mutual funds all around the world. They were not going to hold this stuff, so they didn't care how bad the loans were. So that's what they did. They went out and they made this huge volume of toxic loans and then they went all over the world and they sold this stuff and they built people into buying these, these crappy securities. And then some of these companies got smart after they started doing this for a few years. They realized, hey, we're putting all this crap into the financial bloodstream of the, of the world. There has to be a money-making opportunity in this for us. So let's go out and let's bet against the same properties, the same products that we're selling out there in the open market. Derivatives. We'll get all this crap in this bag and we'll sell it off to unsuspecting fools for like the, the New York State Pension Fund or the Mississippi Retirement Fund or the Connecticut Carpenters Retirement Fund. We'll sell our shit to them and then we'll bet against it. How did they bet against it? They went to insurance companies like AIG and they essentially bought insurance a kind of insurance against their own product. Don't we own AIG? Now we do. <laughs> Here's how this worked. It's, it's, it's sort of like selling a lot full of cars with no brakes and then buying life insurance on all the drivers. That's really what they did. <laughs> they got smart. They went to AIG. They sold all this shit to all these this, this dangerous, toxic stuff out into the, in, into the market. And then they went to, to companies like AIG and they bought credit protection against those same products. And then what happened? AIG went out of business. And so what did these companies do? They went straight to the government and they said, this is an outrage. We're not going to get our bets paid off if AIG goes out of business. If AIG goes out of business and, and is allowed to go to bankruptcy, the bets we made against our own product, we will not be able to collect. And that would be an outrage. So therefore, we need a bailout. We need a federal bailout to, in order, so we can collect our bets. And that's what they got. The government went in and they paid 100 cents in the dollar for all the bets that these companies made against their own product. In the case of Bank of America, uh, Merrill Lynch, which is also a subsidiary of Bank of America, they collected $6.8 billion from the AIG bailout. Bank of America itself collected $5.2 billion, and that's all your money. That's taxpayer money that went to pay off the bets that these assholes made against their own product. Shut them down! So, that, so years later, after all of this, what did we find out about all these transactions? We found out that not only did they defraud dozens of major institutional investors all over the world, like the New York State Pension Fund, which collected a $624 million settlement from Bank of America, uh, from retirement funds in Mississippi and Los Angeles County and Connecticut. Uh, not only did they defraud those people, they also defrauded the insurers. Remember how we, they said, we're going to insure these bonds? Well, they, went, they also lied to the insurers who, who gave them these insurance policies on these bonds. They lied about who, who the people were who were buying these mortgages. The insurers didn't know how bad these loans were, and a lot of them went out of business. Companies like AMBAC, which had existed for decades, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world, went bankrupt, largely because of companies like Bank of America, because they ended up insuring all this crap that they had to pay out claims on. Uh, one company, AMBAC, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, AMBAC paid $466 million in claims on mortgage-backed securities because they were insuring stuff that they had no idea how bad it was. Uh, we also found out that, um, that, that Bank of America was systematically overcharging its depositors during this time. They were involved in a whole range of uh, I illegal activities. Did you say systematically? Systematically, Everybody? Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> So, anyway, the lesson being that Bank of America essentially is a state-supported bank. They got bailed out by the government when they, when they engaged in all these transactions. 
Uh, we gave them $45 billion in bailout money uh, in, in 2008. $25 billion of that was to buy Merrill Lynch. Uh, and when they acquired Merrill Lynch, they also acquired Merrill, all of Merrill Lynch's derivatives portfolio, a lot of which were bets on stuff like this. Uh, in fact, last year, Bank of America moved uh, Merrill Lynch's entire derivatives portfolio from Merrill Lynch's books onto Bank of America's books. Now, no, not many people heard about that, but what did that mean? Bank of America is a federally insured depository institution. It's FDIC insured. So now, if all these bets and all this crap, and they have $73 trillion worth of this crap that got moved from Merrill Lynch, trillion, got moved from Bank of America uh, to, uh, from Merrill Lynch to Bank of America, if all that stuff goes south now, it's on us. It's federally insured. All of us are on the hook for all those crazy gambles. And the government allowed that to happen. Uh, essentially, Bank of America um, has gotten away with this fraud scheme over and over and over again, and our, our government has enabled it to do it. Even when caught committing fraud, even when forced by the government to settle and repay some of these claims, they haven't done so. The state of Nevada uh, engaged in a settlement with Bank of America where, they, where Bank of America signed on the dotted line. They, they agreed that they would never again uh, raise the, the interest rates on, on the homeowners who were tricked into buying uh, some of these mortgages, and within days after that settlement, they were out raising the interest rates on their homeowners. Uh, they agreed never to robo. Does anyone know what robo signing is? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, just to review quickly, robo signing. When they <laughs> sold all these, when they sold all these mortgages off, they were contractually obligated to to take care of these mortgages. When they sold from one uh, mortgage from one client to another, they had to go to local uh, registry offices and register the sale. They had to physically transfer the deed. They didn't do any of that stuff. As soon as they sold all this crap to, to pension funds and all their other victims, they stopped worrying about all these mortgages. They just didn't take care of it the way they were legally obligated to do it. And so what did they do when they had to foreclose on somebody? You can't go into court with no documents. They just went and made up all the documents. That's uh, because they're human. <laughs> and you. In, in one deposition, they found that a Bank of America employee, she admitted that she uh, invented over 8,000 documents a month. Wow. So they're systematically, again, systematically <laughs> going into court and perjuring themselves. They have whole departments whose entire job is to make up phony documents and go into court. And we know they're doing this, and we're not stopping them. At least they're all in jail. Who's not stopping them? What do we do, Matt? What do we do? All the, if this was any other any other kind of industry, if the industry, if this was a car company, if this were a health insurance company, all these guys would be in jail. They would be doing time for this kind of fraud. If you went out and you sold a bunch of defective cars that caused people to have accidents, people would go to jail for that. But nobody is going to jail on companies like Bank of America, and they should. Uh, so Bank of America is a totally appropriate target for Occupy Wall Street. It's a company that's barely hanging on, but enough public pressure could really put it under. It could, it could give, make it uh, very difficult. Its share price dropped to $5 last December. If it goes under $5 for more than a month, the company's kaput. But it, it, the only reason it's staying in business is because the market thinks that the government is going to rescue it if it goes under. We have to make sure that enough pressure is put in the government so that nobody ever rescues companies like this again, that they can't engage in this kind of fraud and get away with it. Anyway, that's it. So if anybody has any questions. What do we do, man? What do we do? Question. What about the Wells notices that Wells Fargo and Goldman got last night? You know, I don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, what's it about? It's simple, but it's from the Organization of the Mortgage Mortgage Security. Is that from Schneiderman's committee? I think so. I, like, the question is, it's civil, but it should be criminal. So right. That's, 